Today I'm going to talk about injection molding in the US as well as some issues that I ran into with Fusion 360 where I had to go back to using a 10 year old version of SolidWorks. Welcome to another episode. So I've had a couple other videos showing some of the elements of working on this. And this is a model train throttle. It has Wi-Fi built in down here. And one of the things that I've been working on is the case design for this. What you're seeing here are the first samples we got from an injection molding company in North Carolina. So they made the injection molds, they did all of the molding. And I now have experience doing one of the cases for the larger throttle in China and then one of the cases here in the US. So I thought you might be interested in the differences I encountered between working with uh, China and working with the US. And the thing that's really interesting is the pricing is about the same between China and the US. So we had wanted to do the previous throttle with a mold maker in the US but weren't able to find one at the time. As a result of some of the work I did on PPE for COVID, I learned about this company in North Carolina called Texlon. So we reached out to them for this project. I, I worked with them a little bit on the PPE project. And they were able to give us a very competitive quote. We started the work in January, and I'm gonna take you through just a few of the things that we ran into going back and forth. And then I'm going to show you some of the things that I've run into with the throttle that were my problem, uh, things I didn't notice. So let me explain a little bit about that. For the previous uh, throttle, let me pull that out, uh, which is this one right here, and I'll show you the two side by side. Uh, so you can see that they're similar, but this one is uh, quite a bit smaller than this one. So. For this one, we had the, the molds made in China, as well as the first batch parts made in China. This mold is now in the US, in Pennsylvania, and the parts are being made in Pennsylvania for this one. So for the larger throttle, one of the things we did is we had uh, 3D printed cases made by Shapeways. And these cases were really invaluable for getting the fit and finish right, making sure everything was correct before we went to the mold maker. In the case of this throttle here, we had a time schedule. We wanted to get this out uh, on the market by July. That's not gonna happen, but that was our goal. Because that was our goal, we took some shortcuts. That was a bad idea. Uh, one of the shortcuts we took was instead of having Shapeways uh, 3D prints, they 3D printed them on Form 3 printer, and then they tested it there, but I did not have them send them to me. And one of the problems with the Form 3 as well is when you print something like this, um, there are actually a lot of supports that go along it. Trimming those supports off of the 3D printed part is really hard, and they interfered with the fit between the two halves of the case. So we really should have done a Shapeways 3D print of this case before going to the mold maker. Uh, and if we had done that, I likely would have spotted a couple things that we're going to have to have Texlon change. Again, those are my mistakes. So let me walk you through some of the things we ran into. And then I'm also going to show you how, uh, in order to correct some one of the mistakes, I was unable to do it in Fusion 360. I had to go back to my SolidWorks 2011 license, which is the last version of SolidWorks that I paid for and had no problems making the changes there. I spent a long time trying to do them in Fusion 360 and just could not get it to work. So one of the things I've discovered is I now am going to, in some cases, need to have a workflow that involves both Fusion 360 and SolidWorks. So this is the first issue right here. It's a little hard to see, uh, but the problem is this is a very thin piece of plastic right there. And because it's a very thin piece of plastic, it's hard for them to fill this particular section. It's not a small section either, uh, as you can see there. And so it takes a lot of pressure to be able to fill that thin section. 
there are two things that happen as a result of filling that uh, with a lot of pressure. One is that you get a lot of flash along here, which again may not be easy to see in the camera, but I can definitely feel it. It was also an issue in here in the holes. I had to use a hobby knife to try to clean out the flash so that the, uh, the keypad would fit correctly into the holes. So the other thing that it caused is these pins right here are not as far apart as they should be. Uh, and the result, I mean, what caused that is it didn't shrink as much as they expected it to. The theory that we have is because they had to hold this under pressure to get this to fill, that re uh, reduced the amount of shrinkage. In other words, it was kind of packing the mold a little bit more, and packing will prevent shrinkage. But we want a little bit of shrinkage because the mold was designed for shrinkage. So to fix that, what I did is uh, look to see what my options were. Uh, this case is designed to fit into something called a throttle pocket. So the dimensions here uh, in this direction are, are important. And so what I decided to do is what we did on the large throttle, I'll show you here. So we have a little bit of a bump on the large throttle uh, for a similar reason. And I thought I was going to be able to get by without a bump on this throttle, but that turns out not to be the case. So I'm going to add a bump here. The bump has, doesn't have to be a lot. Uh, basically what I want to do is take this plastic here, which is 23 thousandths of an inch thick, and make it 40 thousandths of an inch. So almost double the thickness. And, you know, see how that does in terms of filling the, the plastic. Uh, this type of thing, as well as some other things that I'll mention, obviously slow down the process. Again, if we had done the 3D prints ahead of time uh, through Shapeways, we probably could have eliminated some of these iterations in the mold. The other thing is I made a mistake with these holes here. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking. I made them 80 thousandths of an inch in diameter, which is the wrong size for the number two screws that I specified for these. Uh, they're small screws because they need to go through uh, the screen and the, the circuit board. I'll do a cross section on this right here. Whoops, wrong dimension. I'm hitting the wrong face again. This face here. And let me pull this out so it's right over the screw pretty much right through the center of the screw. And then notice the threads don't have enough engagement down here. And I'm not sure what I was thinking. If I look here, this is a diameter of 80 thousandths of an inch. And this screw needs a smaller diameter than that. If I look up the specs, you can see that um, 80 thousandths is pretty close to the outer diameter of the threads. And what it's saying here is that the, the hole should be 76 thousandths of an inch. And it may not seem like four thousandths of an inch would matter that much, but this is a pretty small screw and it does. So we're gonna to have to change that to be slightly smaller than it is now so that the screws uh, don't rattle around and actually bite into the plastic. And so th at this point we have two choices. Uh, we can either increase the size of this hole here so that it's a loose fit on the number three screw because it's a little tight at the moment. Or we can reduce this uh, to the correct diameter which is 76 thousandths of an inch. I didn't know if they were using pins here or if they had milled this out. <clears throat> I have since contacted them and this is milled into the mold. So that means because they don't have pins, they want to remove material and they would have to add material to make these larger. So it's easier for them to just remove material from here to make these the correct size for the number two screws. So that's what they're going to go ahead and do. Now let me show, take you to the computer and show you where, what I ran into in trying to create the bump on the front of the throttle. I've rolled the history marker back to just before I added the fillet as you can see here. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to uh, bump out this face before adding the fillet. I'll go here and 
do a projection like so and then just add a line like so and then I can extrude this. So I'm going to want to move it to be 40 thousandths minus 0 0.023 and that's good there. And then the other thing that I want to do is I want to add uh, a nice S-curve to this. So I'll go ahead and add a sketch like so. Pick up those edges. And one of the things I'm noticing is I forgot to add the draft, but I'll pick those up. And then I'm just going to draw a spline, like so. And then I'm going to make this horizontal and that horizontal. So now I have a nice curve, and I also want to pick up this edge here so it's a closed curve. Now before I forget what I was doing, oh yeah, so I'll go ahead and uh, extrude that. And I'll do symmetric. Actually I'll do two sides. That way I can go to here. And then on the other side, I can go to here. So now I have that my nice um, transition. And then I'll go ahead and add the draft back in, which I think was uh, three degrees. So I'll draft, pull direction, faces. Let's see, that went all the way around. And I think it was three degrees. And I can never remember whether it's plus or minus. So what I usually do is, but okay, here's what's happening. So. I'm not sure why I'm getting this. Um, it's really bizarre. Uh, I get error messages like this saying it doesn't like a feature and I can't accept it. So that means that doesn't work. So I tried a whole bunch of other things and I kept getting error messages. I tried probably five or six different things. So I finally gave up. I'm going to undo what I was doing here and go back to before here. So I finally gave up and exported this as a step file. Once I exported it as a step file, I then brought it into SolidWorks. And here is where it started with SolidWorks, like right here. So you can see this is the import. I have the same fillets as before, but they're not easy to remove. So what I did is I just created a sketch from around the edges of the fillet and then I did an extrude with the three degree angle. So now I have the same starting point here. Then I was able to pull this whole thing out by 19 thousandths of an inch, add the draft back in, and then I basically did a cutout to give me the bump out like that. Now comes the interesting part. And by the way, I tried the same exact set of steps with Fusion 360 and it would not combine the parts. I had to make them separate bodies, but then I couldn't combine the bodies, so it just was not behaving. Uh, the next thing I did here is I added a fillet. Now this is a variable fillet, which is something I haven't been able to get to work in Fusion 360. And uh, then I started to add draft back in, and you know this is the final part that I have. This is the cool thing. So what I did next is I imported the part into Fusion 360. And the cool thing about that is one of the options is to import a new version. And when I do that, I can select the file again. It doesn't remember where it came from, but at least I can select the file and then it will update this version. And when it updates this version, let me unisolate and put this back in. It will update this here. So let me just uh, demonstrate that for you quickly. Um, let me get that set up. I'll go back to SolidWorks. I'll take off a couple of the steps. So I'll take off the fillet and then I'll save this version. And then as I say, when I go back to Fusion 360, if I go in here and 
say, where is it? Import new version. Uh, let me find the file on my computer and I drag it back in place and say upload. Uh, it takes a little while to upload this. Okay, it finished uploading. I skipped over that. It took quite a while for some reason. Um, so this has just been updated and if I open this file, you can see that it doesn't have the fillets anymore, but it has the bump. And if I go back to my file here and then say uh, import the latest version, you can see it's also been updated. So I found the workflow between SolidWorks and Fusion 360 to work pretty well. I'm going to go ahead and uh, go back to SolidWorks and uh, basically go forward in the timeline. Save that back out again, go back to Fusion 360, import the latest version, and pretty much go back to where I was before. And then for this file, I can just close it and not save what I changed. So I'll just open it again. And that's the process that I went through. I opened the wrong version. So that's the process I went through to get this version here. Uh, and by the way, the file is updated now, so if I click here, this should not change on me. It should go back to what it was before, as you can see it does. I sent this version uh, off to the injection molder, and they're going to be working on updating the mold with this version and see if it makes it better. I do have the option of bumping this out a little bit more if that's not enough. So at least we have a solution. But um, one of the things I learned from this is that SolidWorks really does have a lot of capability, capabilities. I do kind of miss SolidWorks, but I'm not willing to pay the $5,000 or so that it would cost to buy a new license because I can't update my old license without paying for every single year since 2011 that I have not paid for maintenance. So it would be more expensive to bring my current license up to date than to buy a new version. So I'm going to stick with Fusion 360 and then go out to SolidWorks for things like you saw just when I need to. Now let me talk about some of the differences between working with a Chinese mold maker and a US mold maker. There's some obvious ones such as the language difference and the time zone difference. Being able to, to speak directly to the people at Texelon by phone as well was very helpful. When we were dealing with a company in China, we were going through a representative. So first we had to contact him, then he had to contact the company in China, and then we'd go back and forth. So there were some uh, mismatches in communication, etc. The thing that may not be as obvious are the next two things. So the first one is with the company in China. Whenever the, there was something that needed to be corrected in the mold, there was a charge. They, even if they were things that there were their mistakes, they would want to charge us. So pretty much any additional work from the first piece of work making the mold was an additional charge. So that means the, the, the entire cost of the mold crept up over time from the initial quote. So their initial quote for the mold was less than the quote that we got for the mold for the smaller handheld throttle here in the US. But with all the charges after it added up, the, the final cost was higher than what we paid here. The other difference, of course, is shipping and tariffs. So the tariffs, um, I think, and the shipping added something like 20% to the entire cost, if I remember correctly. And so again, that pushed the cost up even more. So the price that we paid for the mold for the small throttle here in the US is noticeably less, all said and done than the cost for the mold in China. Another difference though is I would say that the company we were dealing with in China uh, is probably a little bit more experienced than Texlon. Doesn't make a difference for this project? No. 
uh, but it does mean that there are some changes that we made to the molds that uh, perhaps that we didn't have to make for the molds in China. Again, it doesn't make a difference. So, given the choice between working with China and the U.S., we definitely wanted to uh, bring the manufacturing back here to the U.S. So we're really, really happy that we're, we were able to do that. Much of the detail work was done by using graphite electrodes and then a process called EDM, which is electron discharge charge machining, to mill out the details into the cores and the cavities. Here you're seeing the cores and uh, this is what it looks like for one of the mold halves before it's put together. And here are the two mold halves uh, pretty much ready to go into the machine and start injection molding. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe, give me a thumbs up, comment below, and if you're already a subscriber, click the bell icon if you want to be notified when I have a new video. See you next time.